Hello, Northeast Christian Church, and welcome to our online services. Thank you for joining us today. If you miss any part of today's service and you want to catch it again, you can do so by checking us out on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or Spotify. We also encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to stay up to date on everything we have going on here at the church. God bless and enjoy the rest of the service. I, uh, I, I'd so look forward to uh, being with you guys. I'm in maybe 50 churches a year, and you've got the best worship. I mean, Mary Evelyn is just awesome with yeah. leading worship. Amen? <laughs> just absolutely fantastic. And then, you know, I was thirsty. I didn't have any water. And uh, Jesus said, if you give someone a cup of water in my name, great is your reward in heaven. So... I pray a big reward for John Reese, who actually went out to the gas station and bought me this, uh, this jug of uh, Poland Springs. Thank you, John. <laughs> uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, if you don't know, my name is Mike Caparelli. I do, I do travel the country, uh, speaking more specifically on the subject of mental health. I believe that the Church of Jesus Christ is a hospital for those that are sick. I also do work in the prison. Um, the last two years, if you're not familiar, I've conducted a 100-hour case study on a guy by the name of David Berkowitz, who at one time was probably the most hated man in America in the 1970s. He was known as the son of Sam. He had gunned down 13 people, stabbed one, lit 1,300 fires, and he held an entire city hostage in fear. While the son of Sam was arrested in 1977 at 24 years old, he's been incarcerated for 46 years. And then in 1988, the son of Sam uh, became a son of God. And uh, I got the opportunity to see the transformation. Amen. You can give it up for that. <clears throat> I got to see the transformation of a psychopath. The clinical community says that psychopaths make no headway in therapy. Cancel culture says it's impossible for them to change. And uh, for me to tell this story in book form is really, it's the story of the gospel, that the gospel has the power to transform anyone and everyone, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord. That's a very exclusive term or inclusive term. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, that's David, that's you, that's me. Amen? Uh, if you could, you could see me afterwards. You can get a copy of the book. Uh, it's both a story on his time in New York City, some of the mental health factors and spiritual influences behind his crimes. But more importantly, it's the last, it's a review of the last 35 years, his transformation into a child of God. I also have a copy of it in Spanish, with the Spanish paperback, as well as the hardcover. Your pastor came in, he met David uh, I'll tell you, Pastor Paul is just so funny, so comfortable. That I just visited David last Saturday. He's still asking for Paul, asking how he's doing. So, uh, you know, Paul wins people's hearts pretty quickly, and I know that they'll be friends for a very long time. Here's what I am asking. I'm asking, if you've already bought the book, if you please consider, right now there are 300 inmates in Cook County Juvenile Jail. It's the largest uh, juvenile jail in the country. I was locked up at 17. It was the first place I heard the gospel. By the, a guy by the name of Mike Krautman had shared the gospel with me when I was 17, locked up in juvenile jail. I know what God can do. We've already raised money for 270 uh, books for 270 inmates. We only need 30 more. So if you see me afterwards, I can give you a card. It costs you $20. It'll send you to the website, and Amazon will deliver the book right to uh, Mrs. Brown at Cook County, and she'll make sure that one of the inmates, ages 12 to 18, um, gets a copy of that. Amen? Amen? Please keep that in prayer. I do have a message for you today. I want to talk to those of you that are plagued with guilt. I want to talk to those of you with a heavy conscience. My prayer this morning is that the blood of Christ would cleanse your conscience. My prayer today is that the guilt you've been carrying, that you lay that burden at the altar. In fact, if you don't lay that burden of guilt down at the altar, there's a whole bunch of people in your family that are going to have some fun with you this holiday. 
How many come from some families of guilt trips? Any Italian Americans in the house? Guilt is a great impetus, it's a motivator for action in Italian families. <laughs> Open up your Bible to Luke 18. We're talking about a heavy conscience. We're talking about guilt. The last 50 years of psychiatry, there's been a great deal of focus on the emotional makeup of man in healing emotions. And I've written a few books on the subject. But you are not just emotional. You are also moral, and you are also existential, and you are social, and you are biological. In fact, I would argue that there's some depression that is not rooted in emotions, but some of it is rooted in morality. That's a controversial statement. There are 251 psychotic and neurotic disorders listed in the DSM. I wonder how many of them are rooted in fear and in guilt. One psychiatrist said, if I could convince my patients that their sins were forgiven, I'd be out of a job in a week. Am I saying that all depression is rooted in guilt? I'm not saying that. But I am saying that you are not just emotional, you are moral, and because you are moral, because there is a moral center, when you and I are not right with God and we are not right with people, we are not right with ourselves. That's a pretty controversial statement, isn't it? You can go YouTube a guy named Jordan Peterson. He's not a believer per se, although he's very close to the kingdom of God. I pray for him regularly. I'm a big fan. He's a psychologist, and he's reintroducing morality back to psychology. Because too often we have focused on the emotions, but we have not dealt with the conscience. And this morning, my prayer is the word of God would minister to those with a heavy conscience because there may be a sorrow in your life that is rooted in guilt. And I pray that that guilt today is rectified at the foot of the cross. That's a pretty controversial statement now, isn't it? But that's the gospel. Luke chapter 18 the Bible speaks of two men that walk into the temple to pray. It's a parable. Jesus tells the parable in Luke 18. Father, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that as we look into it, it looks into us. I pray this morning, those that are under a weight of guilt, rehearsing, rehashing mistakes and misdeeds, things they've done wrong intentionally and things they've done wrong unwittingly. Today, I pray the cross of Jesus Christ would set us free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Let this word set us free from a heavy conscience, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you stand as we read the Word of God? Luke 18, verse 10. Jesus speaks of two men that go into the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Now, tax collectors were the hustlers of that day and age. A tax collector's got what it takes to take what you got. They're not the beloved of society. The Bible says the Pharisee, the tax collector, they walk into the temple. The Pharisee stands by himself, and he prays, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I'm not like extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tithe on all I get. But the tax collector, standing afar off, he would not even lift his eyes to heaven. He beat his breast, and he said, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went back to his house justified. Somebody say justified. justified. 
You may be seated. These uh, two little boys, Frankie and Mario, they were the two scoundrels of the neighborhood. And mom and dad were at wit's end. I mean, they don't know what to do. They hear about the local priest. He's infamous in Boston. He's actually, he's more renowned in Boston for straightening out scoundrels. They bring Frankie Mario to meet with him, and he says, look, I want to meet with Frankie first. He says, keep Mario at home. I'll meet with him tomorrow. And when he meets with Frankie, he's seated with Frankie. He looks at Frankie. Frankie's only about eight years old, and he asks a question that he's hoping will awaken his conscience. He says, Frankie, he says, where is God? Frankie don't say anything. He just looks at him straight, speechless, doesn't know how to respond. The priest asks the question again. He says, Frankie, where is God? Still no response. A third time, the priest makes a fist. He pounds his fist against the table, and he says, Frankie, where is God? Frankie gets up. He runs out of the office, races home, runs into his bedroom, shuts himself in his closet, locks the door behind him. Mario opens the door. He says, Frankie, he says, what happened? He says, Mario, he says, we're in big trouble. God went missing and they think we did it. <laughs> I, I want to talk about a heavy conscience. Now, Princeton University conducted a fascinating study about 20 years ago to show that a heavy conscience is more than a metaphor. They took two groups of people, a control group, experimental group, and they asked both groups a question. They asked the control group to recall an ethical decision they'd made in the last seven days, some act of charity, some gesture of generosity, and then they asked them to predict their body weight. They asked the experimental group a little bit different of a question. They asked them to recall an unethical decision, some immoral gesture, and then they asked them to predict their body weight. And when the results came in, the group that thought about the unethical decision had predicted their body weight to be substantially higher than their actual weight because the conscience can be very heavy. In fact, studies show that a heavy conscience, a conscience that is plagued with guilt, neurology shows that your GABA level, levels go down. GABA is the chemical that helps you sleep at night. How many have lost some sleep because of a heavy conscience? Now there's some of you saying, I must be a good person because I sleep very good at night. There are two reasons why people sleep good at night. Either a good conscience or a bad memory. So maybe you do sleep good, and maybe it's not because you got a good conscience, maybe because you got a bad memory. Either way, guilt is a weight. It is a weight. Listen, that weight of guilt, it is not just a social construct. It's more than a dimension of the psyche. Romans 1 said, the very finger of God that inscribed the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone, that same finger, he inscribed his law on your conscience. So when you are dealing with guilt, you are dealing with God. The efforts we go to to try to gag the guilt. And really, we're not just trying to gag the guilt, we're trying to gag God. We're not just putting a censor on our conscience, but we are putting duct tape on the very mouth of the Almighty because that conscience is a very portal. It is a conduit for the voice of God. And oftentimes, when we don't behave good, we don't feel good because the conscience accuses us and we do whatever we can to silence the voice of that prosecutor. How many of you know what I'm talking about? 
How many are good at justifying? I had to teach my kids. I said, listen, when you apologize, don't rationalize. Just apologize. Don't write an apology letter and then put an addendum at the end of the letter. Just say, I'm sorry. Don't say, I'm sorry, I lace your meatballs with laxatives. <laughs> but you were getting on my nerves. No addendums at the end of the apologies. I taught my kids, I didn't just teach them how to do the right thing. I taught them to do the right thing after you do the wrong thing. Because I knew they were my kids. They got my genes. The day came, my daughter Olivia, about eight years old, she throws a grapefruit at her brother. My son hits him in the head. We were going to the store that day. I said, Olivia, here's the deal. I said, I'm not taking you to the store until you apologize to your brother. She sat down, my eight-year-old daughter. She writes an apology letter. I'm proud. I'm feeling like, wow, she's really getting it now. Contrition, repentance, penance. She's writing the apology letter. She wraps up the apology letter. She slips it under her brother's door. I can't help it. I got to look and see what she wrote. I opened the apology letter, and here's what it, what it wrote. This is back eight years ago. She put, <laughs> Daddy told me to say I'm sorry, so I'm so sorry, you big butt cheek. <laughs> From Livy. She's learning. <laughs> Now, you know, here's, here's the deal. Can I, can I come down there? Is that all right? You know, we, we, we don't just do wrong. But when we do wrong, there, there's this nagging need inside of us to somehow make the wrong right. We justify. In this story, there are two men... They walk into the temple, and understand, when you walk into the temple of God, for the Jews, the temple, all of the emblems of the temple reinforce the righteousness of God. The showbread, the Torah, the Ark of the Covenant, the altar, they knew they were standing in the company of the holy, and not only was this a revelation of God's holiness, but this was also an exposure of of man's sinfulness and in this moment of exposure one man justifies his sins the other man his sins are justified in a moment of utter exposure a moment when they're caught Pardon the expression, with their pants down, they're caught with egg on their face, two men standing in the company of the holy, and one man, he justifies his sins, and the other man, his sins are justified. My prayer today is that if you've come into the sanctuary and you've justified your sins, first of all, all the justifications and all the rationalizations, the guilt doesn't go away. How's it working for you? Now, you might even be an attorney. Attorneys are pretty good at justifying. In fact, if there are any attorneys in the house, please raise your hand. Can you please raise your hand? Because we, we want all those with some criminal backgrounds to pay attention to the attorneys. Because you need a good lawyer. You need a lawyer that knows how to justify. It's justify, never sin. Right? This guy, he's, he's dying. He's a wealthy man. He's got $3 million cash. He loves his wealth so much. He meets with his three friends. One of them is an attorney, by the way. Meets with his three friends. He says, look, you know how much I love my money? He says, when I die, he says, when you bury me, I want to be buried with all $3 million cash, all right? He gives the cash to all three friends. Day after the funeral, all three friends meet for coffee. The first friend says, I feel so guilty. He says, I kept the million the second friend says, I feel so stupid. I buried him with a million. <laughs> the third friend, he's an attorney. He ain't saying much. The two friends look at him. He goes, so which is it? Do you feel guilty or do you feel stupid? He says, I don't feel either. He says, how'd you pull that off? He says, I wrote him a check for a million dollars. <laughs> All the efforts we go to to justify, 
to somehow rationalize, to somehow make a wrong right. And in this passage, we have this Pharisee, and he's justifying his sins. He's using very popular arguments, their rationales that you and I use every day. They're the kinds of rationales that we use to gag that guilt. And in gagging the guilt, we're gagging God. We use these rationales to censor our conscience, but somehow it still doesn't do the trick because only the cross of Jesus Christ, only the blood of the Lamb can cleanse our conscience. Without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sins. Now listen, I preach a lot on mental health, but I don't know one sermon in the last few years that I haven't preached that has been this gospel-centered. This is as Billy Graham as it gets this morning. This morning, if you're trying to justify or rationalize your sins, you are on the wrong path. There's the doctrine of justification. It's what Jesus did on the cross, and only he can make every wrong right. And when you receive him, you don't just receive salvation, but you receive liberation from all guilt and all shame. I don't think it's coincidence that the day I got saved was the day I got delivered from depression. Now, I still, to this very day, I still deal with that melancholy cloud. It's followed me probably since I was about 9 or 10. I've got a mother that is just plagued with melancholy from the time I was a kid. I understand it. It runs deep in my family. But let me tell you, I may have that melancholy, but the melancholy does not have me. When I gave my life to Christ 28 years ago, he gave me a new name, and he gave me a new heart, and he gave me a new conscience, and the guilt... The guilt, the weight of guilt came off my back that day and I was set free. I know how sick you can get from your secrets. I met with David Berkowitz 100 hours and I knew from a PhD in behavioral science, working in the prison for a long time, I knew the man had something he wanted to tell me. I knew he had a secret. I won't tell you what that secret is. You can buy the book. (laughs) But I I knew he had something to get off his chest. I could tell by the defensiveness. I could tell by the neurosis surrounding certain subjects. And there's there's a neurosis in your life. There may be a defensiveness. And underneath that defensiveness, underneath all those justifications, is a conscience that is yearning to be cleansed. And the Pharisee's solution for his sins is not the right solution. He justifies his sins through two popular arguments, two rationales that we still use to this very day. In a moment of exposure, he uses the rationale of compensation. I'll work off my bad sins by my good deeds. And he uses the rationale of competition. I'm not as bad as as the next guy. Can I talk to you about those two issues? Because chances are, if you're on that track and you're justifying your sins, the guilt is not going away. It may work for a minute, but you wake up and the weight of guilt is still there. Psalm 35, David speaks, or Psalm 34, David speaks of the sickness of the soul when keeping a secret, a secret that you haven't told God, a secret that you haven't told your brother. My prayer today is that you come clean before God, come clean before the people of God, and leave with a clean conscience. Let's talk the justification of compensation. He says, I fast. I tithe. He says, listen, I may have some vices, but my virtues offset my vices. I may have some depravity, but my morality, it cancels out my depravity. These good things I do, the good deeds are somehow weighing out. They're offsetting the bad deeds. He's expecting to work off. And there are people here, you've been trying to work it off. In fact, you may have some people in your family that pick up on that vibe, and they've made a good slave out of you. How many know what I'm talking about? Compensate. 
There's only one problem with this logic. The Pharisee has obviously not read the prophet Isaiah. He hasn't opened up the scroll to read the prophet's words. The prophet didn't say, your, good, your bad deeds are like filthy rags. He said, your good deeds are like filthy rags. I mean, it's one thing for a coach to tell an athlete on a bad day, you're not that good. It's another thing for a coach to tell an athlete on his best day, God is telling you on your very best behavior that even your best behavior, according to the prophet Isaiah, your best behavior is filthy rags. That's pretty, that's pretty tough pill to swallow. Well, we're evaluating actions, but the Lord does not look at the outward appearance. The Lord sees the heart. While you're evaluating your actions and feeling really good about your actions, God is seeing the intentions. Do you know that what looks altruistic on the surface can be very narcissistic at the core? Two puppies are cuddling in a park on a cold night. Middle of a park, it's cold. Two people walk by. Lady that doesn't know any better, she says, look at those puppies. They're keeping each other warm. The wise lady says, they're keeping themselves warm. How many behaviors look altruistic on the surface, but are very self-serving and narcissistic at the core? Oh, you thought the only narcissist was your ex. I got news for you. Every single one of us has a potential narcissist inside of us. I, I, I can prove it. If I took a group photo right now, took a picture of every single one of us in this room, I show you the picture. Whose face do you go looking for first? Huh? And if you don't look good, we're going to take the picture all over again and drop another 50 on the photographer because your hair is out of place. See, we come up with all these categories of people. Listen, I, I'm a behavioral scientist. I, I understand the 251 labels and classifications for human behavior, from psychopath to borderline to bipolar to depression. I got news for you. The potentiality is in everyone. When I looked at David Berkowitz, I didn't see a monster. I saw a mirror. But yet, in our day and age of humanism, where we've been fooled into believing that we're good, when someone is bad, it's an anomaly. Here's the deal. We are having delusions of goodness. Delusions. Delusions of competency. Delusions of righteousness. There is not one righteous, not one single person righteous before God. If your goodness was good enough, then Jesus would have never had to die on the cross. But yet, to gag the guilt, which is essentially to gag God, in the moment of being aware of our depravity, we brag on our morality. In the moment of being discovered for what we did wrong, ask any employer who has to correct an employee. You bring up the wrong to the employee, and the first response, it's visceral, is usually they present the right they did, and they're hoping the right will somehow cancel out the wrong. How many have done this to gag the guilt? You, you know, even the worst offenders in society do this? When David Berkowitz was prowling the streets of New York City, gunned down 13 people, looking for a victim, he would leave his post office job at 12.30 at night, midnight, he'd get in his car, inside the glove compartment was the 44 caliber, he would prowl the streets looking for a victim. The same time he was looking for a victim, locked in his trunk was an emergency kit, just in case he came across someone stuck and they needed a little bit of help. I'm not being funny. 
In fact, on one particular occasion, January 1977, he's looking for someone to kill, and he, while he's driving through Queens, a lady's stuck in a snowbank. Her friends are in the car. It's cold. He gets out. He helps them out of the snowbank, and then he goes on his merry way because he said, somehow, it made me feel a little more human. Even the worst offenders among us God has etched the Ten Commandments into our conscience, and we do whatever it takes to quiet the voice of conscience. Are you hearing me? The worst offenders among you. Now listen, is there a state called reprobate? Absolutely. In fact, I would argue that reprobate is the biblical parallel for psychopathy. The difference is the Bible recognizes it's a state that anyone and everyone can fall into. And the culture says the psychopath is a separate species. There's a psychopath in every single one of us providing the right circumstances. A sweet little elderly lady will hit you in the head with a tire iron. You're just going to meet my grandmother. No one is four foot ten, but she's not afraid of anyone. She'll hit you with a tire iron. And then make pasta vazul after to quiet the conscience. <laughs> so in our parable, you got the first guy, and in a moment of depravity, he brags, or exposure to depravity, he brags on his morality, and he says, I fast and I tithe. Second thing he does, competition. He says, look, I'm bad, but I ain't that bad. Now, how many times have you, to gag your guilt, have said, okay, wait, hold on one second. I did wrong, but I didn't do as bad as the other guy. God's not grading you on a bell curve. He's not lining you up with your neighbor. The Bible doesn't say all have fallen short their neighbor's decency. It says all have fallen short God's glory. He's not ranking you up with the next guy. He's grading you against the righteousness of his son. But yet somehow, somehow we say, well, I'm not that bad. Now, it's kind of an amusing thing this guy is doing because in behavioral science, science, we call this the fundamental attribution error. It's a very common behavior of people, especially when there's conflicts. Uh, countless studies have shown this theory to be true about human nature. Let me teach you something. I'm going to geek out on you for a minute. There are two attributions for human behavior, two. Attribution is to explain the cause of something. There's either a situational attribution, which is what you're basically saying is someone acted that way because of the situation. They were tired, they had a traffic jam, it was a stressful day, so they behaved like a mama luke. Mama luke is an Italian colloquialism for fool. Okay? Somebody say mama luke. Look at your neighbor, say don't be a mama luke. You're not swearing, I promise you. A situational attribution says a person behaved like a mama Luke because of the situation. A dispositional attribution is a person behaved like a mama Luke because they are a mama Luke. It's in their nature. It's part of their character. It's part of the disposition. Now watch this. Fundamental attribution error which is, by the way, a theory that has been shown to be true in conflicts, studies that have been done on conflicts for the last 40 years. The fundamental attribution error is when you blow it in some way, you tend to make situational attributions, but when your husband or wife blows it, you make dispositional attributions. Did you catch that? So, you didn't catch that. If, if, if you're a jerk, it's because of the situation. If your spouse is a jerk, it's because they're a jerk. <laughs> Did you catch it now? That's the fundamental attribution error, is that we are just hardwired to judge ourselves graciously and to judge our neighbors harshly. We are hardwired that when you blow it, it's because you blew it, you're a loser, but when I blow it, it's because of the circumstance. How many can say it's a little convicting right now? See, if you're married, you're like, oh boy, is he giving an altar call? 
Now, the Pharisee's really thinking in his mind, well, my, my sins are not that bad. I mean, not as bad as his. But he's falling under this very common snare is that we actually think the crimes we've committed are misdemeanors while the crimes of someone else are felonies. And in the heavenly courts, we're all felons. Whether you committed the deed of murder or whether you're carrying the seed of murder, whether it's malice, mental murder, or homicide, actual murder, every single one of us is a felon in the courts of God. Now, this is the kind of message, when you say this to the world, this is the kind of message that it, it necessitates backlash because we live in a day and age where people pride themselves in their morality as evident by the moral outrage, but the truth is we've all fallen short the glory of God. John Bradford, I'll, I'll ending in a minute, John Bradford was a, a man of God back in the 1700s, and he... Uh, Back in those days when a man was convicted of a crime, it was a public spectacle. They'd walk through the city, and hecklers would come out, and they'd spit on the man. They'd call him names. In one particular scenario, this guy comes out, and he's, he's sentenced to death. I'm not really sure what the crime was, but he's walking to his execution. The town people come out, and they're hollering. All the things you see on Facebook, all the social media posts that speak about the worst offenders and how they're irredeemable and they can't change, all that kind of language. And John Bradford, he stands up and he points to the criminal and he says out loud amidst all the hecklers, he says, there but for the grace of God go I. There but for the grace of God go I. Now this morning, if you're under that weight of guilt, the compensation in the competition, all those types of justifications, it's not working. But I do know what works, and that's the blood of Christ. When the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses your conscience, when you come clean before God and you come clean before the people of God, my prayer this morning, today is your release date. The parole committee of heaven is met, it's ruled in your favor. I pray today is your release date, release from guilt, release from depression, release from anxiety, release from the fear of doom and punishment. My prayer this morning is your conscience would become your friend. My prayer today is you come to the cross and you plead. Don't plead not guilty. Plead, Lord, have mercy. Because as long as you plead not guilty, the gospel doesn't work for you. Jesus did not come for the not guilty. He came for the guilty. As long as you plead not guilty, as long as you justify, as long as you rationalize the benefits of the gospel, they cease to operate because he has not come to call the healthy. He's come to call the sick. So I'm not pleading not guilty. I'm pleading Lord, have mercy. It is the second man, the Bible says, and he walked away justified. And isn't that the thing that you and I want so badly and it comes out in the vernacular of everyday life is we're looking for something to justify us. We're looking for someone to make what was wrong right. I pray today you would plead, Lord, have mercy. That's what we're looking for. We're looking Listen, guilt is to the soul what pain is to the body. It says there's something wrong, and the wrong must be made right. 
The guilt is not a problem, not in the initial stage. Behavioral science shows that guilt in the beginning stages is actually very productive. It elevates cortisol, it elevates norepinephrine, which helps you focus very deeply on something. Now you got norepinephrine, you got cortisol in that initial stage. It's telling you, get it right, make it right. Something's wrong, you gotta make it right. But if you don't make it right in that initial stage, the GABA levels drop, now you can't sleep. Now the guilty conscience that was once there to help you, now it's going to hurt you. I want my conscience to accuse me when I'm doing wrong. Yeah. Amen? I want my alarm clock to, to, to sound when I'm sleeping. I want the rooster to crow when I'm asleep. I believe Peter heard the rooster because I think Peter was in a moral slumber and the rooster was the ancient alarm clock. Judas never heard the rooster. Peter heard it. I pray this morning, morning that when you're wrong, your conscience would tell you you're wrong, but quickly you would repent and say, God, I'm not pleading not guilty. Lord, I'm pleading. Lord, have mercy. This is the insultingly simple gospel this morning. But its benefits are as sophisticated as it gets. Every emotional, psychological paralysis, I pray today it ends at the foot of the cross. Make us right with you as Pastor Paul comes and leads us to the body and to the blood of Jesus Christ. Bless us today, we pray, Lord. Forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us for today's service. If you missed any part of this sermon or you want to catch it again, you can do so by going to Apple Podcast, YouTube, or Spotify. And I also encourage you to go to lolag.org or ne-cc.org if you want to stay up to date on everything we have going on. God bless, and we'll see you next week.